Lord in the midst of us. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Today, uh, I want to talk about grace and mercy. So I, I don't want to talk about grace karunia mulia, but <laughs> uh, yes, but it is it is a, a glorious grace. It's a glorious grace, karunia yang mulia. Yes, uh, we talk about that this morning. Grace is actually a strange concept. Grace is a strange concept. Maybe can you, you, you can reduce the, the feedback here in the monitor, the monitor only. So in general, everyone realized that we are sinners, right? So, but you know, the grace is a strange concept. I'm a sinner. I admit and I confess my wrongdoings, admitting and all my shortcomings. 1 John 3, 1 said that, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is, and that is what we are. We call the sons of God just by, by grace. We talk about grace today. So we talk about grace. But you know, Human being, um, grace is a strange concept. For instance, uh, in the natural, when you covet anything, and I have the money, I'll purchase that, uh, and that toy, from that on, belongs to me, right? Yeah. I want to take this example. We have this brother has, who has a Maserati here. So, again, um, if you pay the price, you lease or you pay or you purchase, then from there, from that moment, uh, that Maserati will be yours, right? But grace is different. So that is in the natural like that. You pay the price and it belongs to you, right? But grace is different. It's a strange concept. And we cannot fathom the truth of grace. So when Jesus said that whosoever believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life, Jesus said that in First John three sixteen. All the kids, all the Sunday school children, knows about this verse by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him will not perish but have Everlasting life, right? Just by what? Just by what? Just by faith. Just so. So it's not. It's different than paying that Maserati. It's different. So it's totally different than the concept of human being and the concept of God, and the concept of human being in the natural. You want something, you pay the price, and that belongs to you. You haven't paid. That doesn't belong to you. And if you think that you have it already, you just uh, uh, help yourself on some other, some other belongings, then you will, you will be handled by police, right? If you help yourself. Okay, I, I want to, I think uh, that belongs to me. So I, without paying, you just um, help yourself. And then you have to deal with the police, right? But that is in the natural. So we have to pay, we got it. But in, the, in the Christianity, God said, whosoever believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That is strange, right? Just by belief, it, to me, to me as a human being, it's too good to be true, right? It's too good to be true. It's, it's impossible. You, it's impossible to have... Um, of something that you can have it without paying, right? Is it? Does it make sense? No, it doesn't make sense, actually. Grace doesn't make sense. Grace doesn't make sense because uh, it's, it's, 
without paying, then you will get it. So all religion in the world teach us to give alms, charity, trying to appease with God, and hopefully, hopefully, hopefully receive salvation. We try to do alms, we try to do goodness, we try to do everything we can, try to, like, quote, unquote, bribe God, and then hopefully God will give us salvation. That is all the religion in the, in the, in the world. For instance, if uh, in, in Indonesia, we can see all the Buddhists, the Hindu, they teach us to give offerings. You can see in Bali, a lot of uh, uh, offerings uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the midst of the street. In the, yeah, if all the, all the temples, they have all these uh, offerings. So they, they try to give God the offering with the, with, the, with the hope that God will be a peace will, uh, and make peace with God and hopefully we got salvation. But grace again, John 3.16 told us something that is totally uh, unrealistic. Totally uh, it doesn't make sense. It's a very strange promise. It's hard to believe that this simple act of faith <clears throat> that this simple act of faith will work. It's hard to believe that it can make a fundamental difference in salvation. But if you know what happened behind the scenes, then it starts making sense. If you know what happened behind the scenes, it starts making sense. The word is, I want to tell you about a word that we learn in Bible school that is the word propitiation. Propitiation. First John two two, uh, English Standard Version. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. And NIV is that he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So this is the word propitiation. Because you know that he is the propitiation. He is the substitute. He is the, he is the, he is the Lamb of God that has paid the price. Then suddenly everything makes sense. And now grace, I can say to you, grace makes sense now. Right? Because grace makes sense now because somebody has already paid it. Right? Somebody has already paid. He is the propitiation. He is the atoning sacrifice. When I learned that word, it means to substitute in place of. The Son of God is the propitiation, the substitute, the covering, the mercy seat. You, you know that word, the mercy seat. The mercy seat. He paid on our behalf instead of us being the object of God's wrath. He was the substitute, the covering. When you are as a kid or as a a uh, freshman student here in the United States, uh, you can you can admit you can be admitted to a university or a college because somebody paid your tuition, right? Somebody already paid. Some somebody already paid the price, and so you can go inside. Probably your parents or your guardians or whoever whoever pays. Usually not yourself. Usually, yeah, somebody paid by themselves, but usually somebody else paid it. That is like the concept of grace. Somebody else has already paid the price. God is just. He must penalize all transgression. There is one who received the penalty of sin by paying the full price for you. One time the Israelite committed sin and God punished his people. People are, were dying like in the midst of a pestilence. In modern time, now we, we have been hearing, this is what happened in West Africa with the Ebola. You heard happening right now in Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone, uh, probably also Nigeria. You know that uh, Houston has direct flight connection with Nigeria directly. So if we somehow 
the screening was not so tight, there is a chance that a patient with the Ebola virus will come to Houston. Welcome, welcome to Houston. It, it can happen. And uh, so in, in modern time, uh, in West, uh, here in West Africa now, Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Nigeria, and all, and I heard another country also over there, it was a pandemic. People were left dying on the street with no one helping. I, was, I, I, I watched a, a video where, where all the relatives and the friends just, just left the patient on the street dying, yeah, dying and gasping for, for a breath and then finally died. Uh, we can hear here. Now, I, I talk about this as an analogy of what happened in Israel at that time, where people were dying because they were bitten by the snakes. So at that time, um, people did something bad. They complained to God. They complained to the Lord. And... The, the Lord sent snakes and serpents and then uh, poisonous, venomous snake bitten. In August, um, this is a, now about the Ebola, so that you can understand what, what is happening. At least you, you can grasp what is happening, what was happening at that time. In August, there were 700 Ebola deaths reported in August last month. August is last month, yeah? It's not that far away. And the World Health Organization warned the West Africa Ebola outbreak is out of control. It is spreading far quicker than efforts to contain the disease. The Ebola death toll reached 2,630 two days ago. So 700 in August. Now, two days ago, 2,630. Almost four times than last month. And that is with, uh, with 5,400 patients infected, possibly have uh, Ebola. So that means it's serious, very serious. That's why um, now America and other countries, they probably they, they responded slowly, but we did respond to try to uh, cure the disease or at least uh, um, prevent the spread of the disease. And um, <clears throat> I remember also in, in Revelation 6, we, we heard about the story, uh, about the, the verse. And I looked, there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death. And Hades, Hades was a following close behind him. They were given power over a fort of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague. That is what the kid called plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. So this was already predicted in Revelation 6, 8. So it will happen, and it will surely happen, because the Lord said so. Um, it's probably similar to what happened in like the Ebola. Within just a couple of weeks, almost a month, then it quadrupled. The, the death, uh, like quadruple, is, is uh, exponential. It's not, it's not like, uh, like linear, but it's exponential, right? You know exponential, all the, the smart students here. It, it's it's, um, it's uh, progressing very rapidly. And at that time, um, we, we talk about here in the Revelation 6, 8, that it will kill, according to this verse, Revelation 6, 8, later, when the, the pale horse called death was released, and that will be a quarter of the population will die. So I, I just uh, curious, what, what is the population right now? Is the population of the world is 7.2 billion. 7.2 billion. So when this happened, probably 2 billion people will die. 2 billion people will die. 
two billion is a lot, right? Probably two times of China. Yeah, China is about one billion, probably. So it's it's about two times. So Moses was told to make a bronze servant on a staff. Whoever gaze the servant will live. I want to show on the slide number two. Look at the bronze snake and live. Numbers twenty one four tell us a story. They travel from from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Adam. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread. There is manna. But they said, There is no bread. I don't know what kind of bread they, they meant. Yeah? There is no water. We have water also. And we detest this miserable food. So manna was considered as a detestable, miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israel died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away. So Moses prayed. Uh, Moses is like an intercessor. Um, he's like a, a father to all the, to that nation, Israel. And he prayed, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a snake, put it on the pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So this is again is a is a strange concept. I was I was I was uh, trying to understand why, why the Lord put the snakes, uh, as Moses to put the snake on top of a pole, and let people watch, let people see it, and they will live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on the pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and look at the bronze snake, they will live. So this, this year in June, in June this year, I traveled to Israel. I, I have this uh, second, uh, second time I went to Israel. I, in, when in Tel Aviv, I stay in a hotel. Where it's just a small hotel. CNET hotel in front of uh, another hotel There's, because that area is a lot of hotels then um, the, the, the Gilgal Hotel. From the lobby I could see the Gilgal Hotel where there was a statue of Moses with the bronze serpent. So in Israel actually there are two famous figures that you can find everywhere. Everywhere in Israel. One is the, the pole with the Brown snake, and the second is about. Uh, you remember the the story when, when uh, Joshua, Caleb, and the ten other uh, spies went to spying uh, Israel, and then they brought a big cluster of uh, grapes and pomegranates, and they have to carry by two people, by two men have to carry that, and that that is the the another uh, picture of Israel. So I, I saw that I saw it in front of the hotel, and I try to remember, and I, I remember this story about the about the uh, uh, people are dying, and when they 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 see they watch they gaze upon the snake, the bronze snake, they will live. Is it a strange concept also? It's a strange concept, right? It's a strange concept, but you know. After a while, I read about, about another verse. When they look at the uh, uh, snakes or serpent, it's a symbol of a curse, right? Like from the, from the, from the garden, we know that Adam and Eve, when they, they sinned and then uh, they were cursed, and then um, also the snake was, was cursed. So snakes actually is symbol of Satan, symbol of symbol of curse, the cursed one. So when they look at the cursed one, when they look at the snake, when they look at the serpent, the bronze serpent, they will live. This was the precursor of the one who was cursed and put on a pole for people to see. Who is, who is he? Jesus. So actually, 
that picture, the pole with a bronze snake, that is the cursed one. The cursed one. And when you watch and when you see the cursed one, you will live. The Lamb of God was cursed, right? And whoever looked on the cursed one will live. Isaiah 53, 5 said, But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was put upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. You believe that, right? 53, 5. And that is the, the cursed one. Because of the cursed one. Other translations said, The curse that brought us peace was put upon him, him and by his stripes we are healed. That was the substitution. The stripes, the curse that wood was put upon him, that was the substitution. That was the, on behalf of, that was the substitution of the propitiation that we talked about this morning. The curse that brought us peace was put upon him. So that's why when the Israel look upon the cursed one, they will live. And we also, when we see the cursed one, who is that, the cursed one? Jesus was cursed on our behalf. Oh, uh, if I think about that, uh, I can be emotional. So, Galatians 3.13 said, Clearly, that our Lord became the curse when he was hung on the cross between heaven and earth. At that day, Christ, I, I went to Jerusalem and I saw the Via Dolorosa, the, the road where uh, Jesus Christ was uh, condemned to death, con condemned to die and walk. Upon that Via Dolorosa, the, the small street in Jerusalem walked to Golgotha. You know, that is the cursed one. He was cursed for you and me. So he was the substitute. He was the propitiation. He was the substitute of, of my and your transgression. Galatians 3.30 again stated, stated clearly that our Lord became, became the curse when he was hung on the cross between heaven and earth. And suddenly I realized when I was in front of that hotel, I see the pole, the snake. I know this is the precursor of Jesus who, become, who became the, the cursed one. And we should look upon him because that was his promise. Like when I'm lifted up, when I'm hung on the cross between heaven and earth, I will draw all men unto me. That's why he can bravely say, he can give this promise to you because he has already paid, the, he has been the substitute of your sin and my sin. And he can say bravely, whoever believes in me will not perish, but have everlasting life. So I'm a sinner. I also need to look upon that bronze snake I need, I need to look on the cursed one. When you look at me, the Lord said, when you put your trust on me, I will draw all men. When Jesus said that, he, he said one word, it is finished, one sentence. That is that time. The curtain, the big curtain, the tall curtain that separate the holy holiest and the sanctuary split into two from top to bottom. Now you can enter, you can enter the throne of grace directly. You can enter directly without the need of Zechariah, without the need of the, 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 the great priest. You know, at that time, when the, the, the priest has to do their job, they have to do it exactly as, as uh, been told. He has to uh, sanctify himself first. He has to do all rituals. But when he make a mistake, he can be dropped dead immediately. So at that time, uh, 
the great priest, before they enter the, the Holy of Holies, you know the Holy of Holies, there are the mercy seat, the, uh, the covenant, the Ark of Covenant. Before he, he entered, on, on his robe, uh, there will be a, uh, like a bell, bell on, on his robe. And then his feet brought, uh, they put a tie uh, with a rope. And somebody outside uh, uh, will, will see the rope. And then when he ministered in the, in the Holy of Holies, people will, will hear the, the bell, right? The bell, oh, he is still walking. Because when he make a mistake, that time, he will drop dead. And people cannot come in, into the Holy of Holies because they will be there, there too, right? So they pull, they pull the, the body with that rope. It's that serious. But on that day, when Jesus said, it is finished, the curtain split into two and we can enter directly. Just by grace, just by believing that cursed one, just by believing John 3, 16, whoever believes in me will not perish but have everlasting life. He is the propitiation. Jesus was the propitiation. Jesus was the substitute. Jesus was the high priest who brought him, who brought his own blood to bring atonement for our transgression. So it, it does make sense now why I don't have to pay anything, right? It does make sense. You just believe. On Yom Kippur Day, this is the Day of Atonement. The day to bring reconciliation between people and God. To make peace with God. And the day of, they call it Yom Kippur, is to ask for God's mercy. Two goats will be sacrificed. One will be slaughtered, but it's considered as one sacrifice. One will be slaughtered for Jehovah, and the other will be cursed, will be cursed to take the curse of the Israelite and then cast out to the wilderness. That was the tradition, and they are still doing right now. So that is, now let's talk about the difference between mercy and grace. Grace and mercy are often used together. Grace, we have grace, karunia mulia, and um, we also have uh, mercy. Some, somebody with the name mercy here? <laughs> Marcia or mercy or, or I don't know. Um, we, we have also some, some people with the name mercy. But grace and mercy are often used together in the Bible. Learning from the sermon from, uh, I heard it in, uh, while driving uh, from Dr. Jeremiah, he explained the distinction between grace and mercy. I want you to, uh, to hear that. Grace is God's giving. Can you show slide number four? Grace is God's giving what we don't deserve. Grace is God's giving what we don't deserve. Try to digest that. Mercy is God's withholding what we deserve. Do you know the, uh, the difference between um, grace and mercy? I think, is that, is that the, the next one probably? The next one, yeah. So grace is God's giving what we don't deserve. Mercy is God's withholding what we do deserve. So this is the differentiation. differentiation. So if you um, try to grasp it, I need the grace of God upon my life. I don't deserve to be called the sons of God, right? But he gave it anyway. I don't deserve eternal life, but God granted his son to be the propitiation, to be the substitute for our punishment. And by looking at the bronze snake, by looking at Jesus, by looking at the, at the cursed one, by believing on his name, I will be saved. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's what our Sunday school uh, children uh, be taught. Mercy, on the other hand, is God's holding what we deserve. We deserve punishment for our transgression, right? We deserve that. We deserve death. We deserve we deserve death as a penalty of our sin because that's God said that if you sin, the penalty of sin is death, right? We deserve the death as the penalty of sin, but by his mercy, God withholding death from us. So this is the difference. Do you see the difference between grace and mercy? Grace is God's giving what we don't deserve. Mercy is God's withholding what we do deserve. You see the, 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 the difference, right? So what great mercy has shown to us. So I want to give an example of what mercy is. You, because you, everybody understands what grace is, right? Grace already explained to you what grace is. We receive, we are the recipient of grace. Mercy is when God held Abraham's hand not to harm Isaac, his son. So that, that's supposed to be sacrificed, right? Isaac's supposed to be sacrificed as the propitiation, as the atonement. But God helped stop Abraham's hand. That's called mercy. God's withholding what we do deserve. Mercy was when God prevented the dagger, the, the dagger, the big dagger, to uh, penetrate, to kill Isaac as the sacrifice. You know, at the time, I, I, I realized how Isaac is, a, is truly a, a picture of the Lord Jesus. He surrendered. Isaac is not, a, is not a little boy. He's, he's quite big. I don't know what age, maybe 15, 16, I don't know at that time. So he can rebel, right? He can rebel if he want. First he, he asked, I speak, uh, Isaac was wondering when he walked. I know uh, the area because I went there in the Moriah, Moriah area. The the, the area where, where Isaac was sacrificed, they, they walk, is like a hill. Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son. That's like, probably like Robin said to, to Joshua. Abraham replied, So, yes, my son, I know. And then Isaac said, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Do you know that that time Abraham's heart melt? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two went, went on together. So at that time, later he, he asked again, he asked again, that boy asked again. And Abraham just said, the Lord will provide the lamb. Was that not what he did? When mercy stopped him from punching the body of the uh, Isaac, Isaac's body, at that time, God stopped that, that mercy. And then Abraham looked and there, is a, there was a lamb. God provided the lamb. God provided the lamb. It's not the sacrifice. It's not the alms. It's not the one that I saw in Bali. And all That we do, we try to, to appease God. But this is God himself provide the lamb. God himself provided the lamb. God provided the lamb for Abraham to substitute the sacrifice of Isaac. 
Jesus was provided as the Lamb of God also to be sacrificed on that day. Is that not the precursor of what what is happening? So God provides the Lamb for Abraham. God provides the Lamb of God for by Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. That's called mercy. That's, that's why in, the, in that Ark of Covenant, they call it mercy seat. Covering. It covers. It stops the wrath of God. We all, we deserve death. We deserve punishment for our transgression, but mercy stopped that. Mercy is when God provided the lamb withholding the punishment to us who deserve death for our transgression. You know, when Jesus was portrayed in the, in the Gethsemane, at Gethsemane, that is the, when he prayed, and then he went a little further, Matthew 26, 39 recorded, he fell on his face and prayed, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. So that is to show the, the complete surrender, the complete obedience by the Son of God to Father. Another example of mercy. Mercy is when Jesus withholding his hand and did not stone Mary Magdalene, the adulterer, to death. She deserved death by stoning, but the Son of Man showed mercy on her. I am a sinner too, like, like, like Mary Magdalene, like, like that prostitute. I am a sinner too, and I deserve death and punishment of my transgression. It was his mercy withholding judgment. So understand what is the meaning of mercy in your life. It's God's withholding judgment on you because somebody had already paid the price. God's withholding that, that's called mercy. We deserve, we deserve all the death, we, we deserve punishment. Sometimes you, you heard it. Someone cried, I want to demand justice. I don't want to demand justice for my son. You heard that in the, in the, in the public, right? In the, in the newspaper, in the CNN, all. The... But my brother and sister, I don't want to demand justice. Because if I demand justice, God will punish me because that's justice. I need mercy. We need mercy, my friend. We need mercy, my brother and sisters. We need mercy. God's withholding, God's withholding his punishment to us. So if justice is served, I deserve punishment. I deserve death for missing the mark. I have to pay my debt, but by God's mercy, God withhold the penalty of my sin. Mercy is when Adam and Eve committed sin. And God slaughtered an animal and put the animal skin to cover their shame. And that is the precursor of the slaughtering of the Lamb of God. Because we understand and we know there is a verse called that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So at that time, and even in the garden, God already slaughtered an animal and put the skin to cover the shame of Adam and Eve because they did commit sin. I want to end this sermon with an offer of God's greatest gift to mankind that the salvation. If there is anyone here or wherever this event can be watched, hasn't received Jesus as your Savior, Romans 10 9, this word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And that is with your mouth that you confess and are saved.
So when the next time I want to ask the worship team to lead us 